Nonviolent communication presents a method of communication free from judgments or demands, which results in more productive interactions for all parties involved. The practice of nonviolent communication, or NVC, encourages connection through compassionate conversation, both with others and with ourselves. And Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, founder of the Center for Nonviolent Communication and a global educator, uses this book to introduce to us the NVC process that he's developed. Dr. Rosenberg employs techniques from his experience dealing with conflicts from around the world to share practical and sustainable strategies, giving us all the tools required to effectively communicate our feelings and needs in any situation. Here's what you'll learn about in this audiobook summary. We'll talk about what nonviolent communication actually is and how it can be used to get what you really want. We'll discuss how you can practice NVC at home to connect with family and friends and in the office to connect with coworkers, employees, and employers. We'll discuss how to start on a path of emotional liberation and what to expect on each stage of the journey. We'll discuss the importance of an emotional vocabulary and ways to build that vocabulary through conversations with yourself and others. We'll talk about all of this and much, much more in this audiobook summary edition of Nonviolent Communication. Here are some crucial quotes pulled directly from the book. Quote, NVC helps us connect with each other and ourselves in a way that allows our natural compassion to flourish. It guides us to reframe the way we express ourselves and listen to others by focusing our consciousness on four areas. What we are observing, feeling, needing, and what we are requesting to enrich our lives. Quote, If we express our needs, we have a better chance of getting them met. And the final crucial quote, My experience has taught me that it's possible to resolve just about any conflict to everybody's satisfaction. All it takes is a lot of patience, the willingness to establish a human connection, the intention to follow NVC principles until you reach a solution, and trust that the process will work. A tweetable summary to encapsulate the big idea from this book in a single sentence is this. Getting what you want depends on the honest expression of your feelings and needs to others. Nonviolent communication introduces real ways to communicate without relying on judgments or demands. Big idea number one, connecting with others and ourselves. At the outset of the book, Rosenberg tells us that as we keep our attention focused and help others do likewise, we establish a flow of communication back and forth until compassion manifests naturally. What I am observing, feeling, and needing, what I am requesting to enrich my life. What you are observing, feeling, and needing, what you are requesting to enrich your life. Now, nonviolent communication, or again, NVC is the abbreviation, is a way of communicating that leads us to give from the heart, allowing us to stay connected to our compassionate nature through our relationships with others. Through the practice of NVC, we can stop the harmful communication patterns of defending, withdrawing, and attacking in favor of observing, identifying, and articulating. Now, there are four main components to the NVC process. Observations plus feelings plus needs plus requests. Now, first, we have the concrete actions we observe that affect our well-being. Next, we have how we feel in relation to what we observe. 
Number three, we have the needs, the values, desires, etc., that create our feelings. And finally, the fourth is the concrete action that we request in order to enrich our lives. Now, typically, we first observe what's happening, whether it's something being said or done, and then we quickly introduce judgment or evaluation. Do I like or dislike this message or action? But with NVC, we practice observing without judgment. Here's how a conversation rooted in nonviolent communication might play out. We would start by observing without judgment and then articulate what that message or action makes us feel, followed by identifying what we need in response to that message or action, and then make a request based on that need. So a helpful example is the parent-child relationship. If the parent wants their child to tidy up a family living space, for instance, there are several possible ways to approach this situation. A parent who practices NVC, would say, when I see your dirty socks all over the living room, now that's an observation, I feel irritated, which is a feeling, because I need more order in the rooms we share. That's a need. And then that parent would follow the statement of observation, feeling, and need with a request. Would you be willing to put your socks in the room or in the washing machine? So once again, The NVC approach here would be, when I see your dirty socks all over the living room, I feel irritated because I need more order in the rooms we share. Would you be willing to put your socks in the room or in the washer? That's it. Observation, feeling, need, request. Now, NVC is not necessarily meant to exist as a set formula, but rather an adaptable communication technique that you can use in any situation. Rosenberg reminds us that the essence of NVC is in our consciousness and our conscientiousness of the four components, not in the actual words that are exchanged. Now, through the style of communication that we call NVC, nonviolent communication, we can honestly express our needs, we can honestly express our feelings, and then empathetically receive the needs and feelings of others as well. So here's an actionable insight for you from this first big idea. Identify and write down your own responses to three recent words and or actions from others. And note down whether they are based in judgment, meaning do I like it or do I dislike this message or action, or based in feeling. This action makes me feel hurt or joyful, irritated or amused, etc. And note these down because they'll come in handy as we move into some of the next big ideas and actionable insights from nonviolent communication. Big idea number two, you can't do a don't. Quote, communicating our desires as demands is yet another form of language that blocks compassion, unquote. We have the power to communicate our desires without making demands. But when we judge, criticize, diagnose, and interpret, rather than express our feelings directly, people are more likely to hear criticism and invest their time in self-defense instead of communication. To avoid this, and to maintain productive lines of communication between ourselves and others, we can practice observing without judging. For example, if we want to express frustration about a coworker's tendency to put work off until the last minute, we might be tempted to say something like, Doug procrastinates, for instance. But this kind of communication judges and criticizes Doug and fails to request a change in his behavior, proving unproductive at best and incendiary at worst. Instead, we can practice nonviolent communication and say Doug tends to prepare for his presentation the day before. 
Now, this kind of communication expresses specific concerns without judgment or criticism, and it encourages a solution-based conversation. Vague language contributes to confusion, but we can use clear, positive language to express requests without making demands. Now, by focusing on what we do want to happen rather than on what we do not want to happen, we can speak to our desires. This expression of feeling can be paired with a request for action and a request for reflection to ensure that our needs and desires have actually been heard. Now, if we speak to Doug, we might also be tempted to say, Doug, I do not want you to wait until the last minute to prepare this presentation. Now, this is asking Doug not to do something and provides no direction for what Doug should do. So keep the following maxim in mind. You cannot do a don't. You can't do a don't. So, instead of saying, Doug, I don't want you to wait until the last minute to prepare this presentation, we can say, Doug, I'd like you to have a draft of the presentation done three days before it's due. Will that timeline work for you? Now, this is clearly asking Doug to do something and asking Doug to confirm that he actually understands and will commit to that task. This method of using positive language to express requests for action and reflection can be used when speaking to individuals, but can also be extremely compelling when you're communicating with groups as well. So here's your actionable insight for this big idea. Identify and write down three conversations you've had in the past week, in which you focused on the negative. When did you say don't? And then rewrite those comments or requests to make them more positive. How could you have said do instead of don't? And remember, you can't do a don't. Big idea number three, emotional liberation. Quote, We deny responsibility for our actions when we attribute their cause to factors outside ourselves, unquote. When we communicate in impersonal ways, we're not prepared to encounter people or behaviors we do not like or understand and are likely to react in terms of their wrongness. Now, if an employer assigns a task, for instance, that we don't want to do, They are mean or unreasonable. If a family member, for instance, fails to complete a household chore, they become lazy or ungrateful. Through the practice of NVC, we have the power to turn our attention away from the practice of classifying or determining levels of wrongness when we communicate with others. We also have the power to turn our attention towards what we as well as others, need at any given moment. Dr. Rosenberg refers to this process as emotional liberation and observes that most people experience it in three stages. Stage one is this. We believe ourselves to be responsible for the feelings of others. Now, it's easier and safer to take responsibility for others than it is for ourselves, and we all do it. But this heavy emotional burden can be destructive. Stage two, we get angry and reject the burden of responsibility for the feelings of others. So once we acknowledge this pattern of unnecessary responsibility, we get angry at the time and energy we spent on things we could not change. As a result, this stage is marked by obnoxious claims like, well, that's your problem. We have rigid demands of our own needs. I must have this. This is what I need. It's my way or the highway. Stage three. We turn our attention to our own feelings and take responsibility for our own intentions and actions. Once we have passed the anger of stage two, we can start acting responsibly toward ourselves and our own feelings. These are things we can control, and in this liberating third stage, we see just how productive 
and rewarding our attention can actually be. It's possible to pursue emotional liberation and embrace positivity by turning our focus inward, engaging in responsible exploration of our own feelings, and by avoiding patterns of communication that lead us towards blaming or judging others. Here's your actionable insight for this big idea. Write down your answers to the following questions. For whose feelings do you believe yourself responsible? How does that responsibility make you feel? And have those feelings affected how you communicate with that person? If so, how would you like to change this communication? Big idea number four, voicing our feelings. Quote, by developing a vocabulary of feelings that allows us to clearly and specifically name or identify our emotions, we can connect more easily with one another. Unquote. It's far too common to use the words I feel without expressing an actual feeling. We might say something like, I feel my work is unappreciated. But using the phrase I think would actually be much more accurate. I think my work is unappreciated. Through the practice of NVC, we can distinguish between what we feel and what we think about ourselves and the actions or reactions of others. Expressing our feelings with easily understood words and phrases can help us resolve internal conflicts by treating ourselves with kindness and can also help us to resolve conflicts outside ourselves by approaching others with empathy and understanding. So, for example, if a college student is being kept awake by her roommate, she might try to start a conversation by saying, I feel that it is not right to play music so loudly after 10 p.m. However, when the word feel is used with the word that, no emotions are really being expressed. Instead, the college student in this scenario is expressing an opinion. A more productive start to the conversation would include a feeling, an observation, a need, and a request. For example, I feel annoyed when you play music after 10 p.m. because I need seven hours of sleep before I wake up for work. Would you be willing to play your music through headphones after 10 p.m.? Again, see if you can spot the feeling, the observation, the need, and the request. I feel annoyed when you play music after 10 p.m. because I need seven hours of sleep before I wake up for work. Would you be willing to play your music through headphones after 10 p.m.? So building an emotional vocabulary is a very helpful way to mentally and verbally separate our thoughts from our feelings. In the book, the author provides examples of ways that we might feel when our needs are being met. For example, you might feel appreciative, comfortable, fulfilled, optimistic. And then he also provides examples of ways we might feel when our needs are not being met. For instance, alarmed, confused, helpless, devastated, unsteady. Building your own emotional vocabulary will help you to express yourself and it will also make it easier to interpret the thoughts and feelings of others. Here's your actionable insight for this big idea. Make a list of personal I feel statements and ask yourself if any of them could be presented more effectively as I think statements. Now, if any of these statements are thoughts, find a way to honestly and openly express them as feelings. Next, using the nine words that we just mentioned as a point of reference, brainstorm 10 different I feel words to expand your own emotional vocabulary. Big idea number five, resolving conflict without compromise. Quote, most attempts at resolution search for compromise, which means everybody gives something up and neither side is satisfied. 
NVC is different. Our objective is to meet everyone's needs fully. Unquote. The use of NVC in conflict resolution is very different from traditional styles of mediation, in which the mediator attempts to get everyone to reach an agreement as quickly as possible. This agreement is usually made without any connection between the parties involved and is therefore unlikely to last. But when NVC is used to mediate a conflict, a connection is established, and more often than not, the problem solves itself. Dr. Rosenberg in the book outlines five key steps for NVC conflict resolution. Step number one, express. We express our own needs. You want to remember to use the positive do language in articulating your needs, avoiding the unproductive and problem-causing don't. Step two, search. We search for the real needs of the other person, no matter how they're expressing themselves. This is crucial and will require patience and listening practice. Step three, recognize. We verify that we both accurately recognize the other person's needs, and if not, continue to seek the need behind their words. This step depends on honest communication between both parties. Do not be afraid to ask for clarification here if you need it. If you're willing to recognize the needs of the other party, it's more likely that they'll be willing to recognize your needs. Step four, empathize. We provide as much empathy as required for us to hear each other's needs. This takes as much patience and practice as searching for the other party's real needs, but a clear display of empathy will ensure that both parties feel heard and respected. And finally, the fifth step in conflict resolution using NVC is to verbalize. We use positive language and pull from our emotional vocabulary to propose strategies for resolving the conflict. You want to keep the resolution grounded by making requests in present tense language. Instead of asking what can be done tomorrow or next week, ask what can be done right now. Here's an example to illustrate these five steps of conflict resolution. In a workshop for married couples, a man and woman confessed to suffering 39 years of conflict about money and finances. Six months into the marriage, the wife had twice overdrawn their joint checking account and the husband decided to take complete control of the finances. The wife said, He obviously doesn't want me to spend any money. And the husband responded by saying, When it comes to money, she's totally irresponsible. These comments analyze, assume, they diagnose, but they do not indicate an understanding of need. A more productive conversation would have started with a clear articulation of the husband's needs. For example, I feel scared because I have a need to financially support my family and would have then been followed by the wife's acknowledgement of that need. I hear that you have a need to protect the family and that you're scared because you want to make sure the family is financially secure. See, if one party is experiencing a lot of pain as a result of the conflict, it's important to acknowledge this as well. The wife, in articulating her feelings, could say, I feel hurt and I need to be trusted to learn from past experience. In this case, the husband would acknowledge her by saying, I hear that you are looking for more trust and that you are hurting from years of not being trusted with our finances. Once these needs have been articulated, the pain from years of conflict can be addressed in a productive way, and positive change can begin to be made. Just as individuals can express thoughts when they are trying to express feelings, they can also confuse needs and strategies when engaged in conflict resolution. 
to avoid confusing the two, remember that needs contain no reference to anybody taking any particular action. And strategies refer to specific actions that specific people may take. Now, it's important to remember that using NVC to resolve conflict requires us to recalibrate ourselves and our communication styles. This can only be done by slowly, patiently identifying and rejecting the ways we may have been taught to communicate by well-intentioned but possibly misguided parents, teachers, mentors, and others. Big idea number six, expressing appreciation through NVC. Quote, when we use NVC to express appreciation, it's purely to celebrate, not to get something in return. Our sole intention is to celebrate the way our lives have been enriched by others. Unquote. According to Dr. Rosenberg, there are three components involved in the expression of appreciation through NVC. What you did, which need was met, and what you're feeling now. Let's quickly go over each one. Number one, what you did. These are the actions that have contributed to our well-being. Combined with number two, which need was met, the particular needs of ours that have been fulfilled. And number three, what I am feeling now the pleasant feelings engendered by the fulfillment of those needs. Now, these components can be expressed in any order, but should all be expressed. So let's say that you're approaching someone who's just given a presentation or a lecture on some research that you admire or on some ideas that really inspire you. Now, your first instinct might be to say something like, Oh, you are so brilliant, or you're so intelligent. But these would both be considered judgments, and they'd fail to identify what that person actually said or did that made your life better, that inspired you. So instead, you might approach that person and say something like, Oh, I really appreciated the part of your presentation that dealt with communication. It made me feel hopeful and relieved because I have a son with whom I haven't been able to communicate with in months. I've been desperately searching for some direction that might help me relate to him in a more loving manner, and your presentation has provided the direction I was looking for. You see how much more specific that is? You see how that gives a clear and specific example of how it's positively impacted your life? So understanding the importance of these components can also help us to better accept appreciation from others. When we're able to gracefully accept expressions of appreciation without superiority or false humility, we can build a stronger connection between ourselves and others. So remember, when you are expressing appreciation through NVC, touch on what you did, which need was met, and what you're feeling now. Closing notes. The key takeaway from the book is this. Nonviolent communication is a lifelong practice of speaking and listening with empathy. As we develop our ability to communicate honestly about our own feelings and our own needs, we can see that those feelings are acknowledged and those needs are met, and will be better equipped to address the feelings and needs of others. Some final actionable insights from the book. Take note of your own tendency to judge or evaluate. Always be conscious of it. Make a conscious effort to use positive language. Do rather than negative language. Don't. Work on expanding your emotional vocabulary. And finally, acknowledge the emotional burden of being responsible for the feelings of others and celebrate the responsibility you take for your own feelings.
Now, let's close out this book summary with one last crucial quote from the author himself. Quote, NVC guides us in reframing how we express ourselves and hear others. Instead of habitual, automatic reactions, our words become conscious responses based firmly on awareness of what we are perceiving, feeling, and wanting. We are led to express ourselves with honesty and clarity while simultaneously paying others a respectful and empathetic attention. In any exchange, we come to hear our own deeper needs and those of others. NVC trains us to observe carefully and to be able to specify behaviors and conditions that are affecting us. We learn to identify and clearly articulate what we are concretely wanting in any given situation. The form is simple, yet powerfully transformative. As NVC replaces our old patterns of defending, withdrawing, or attacking in the face of judgment or criticism, we come to perceive ourselves and others, as well as our intentions and relationships, in a new light. Resistance, defensiveness, and violent reactions are minimized. When we focus on clarifying what is being observed, felt, and needed, rather than on diagnosing and judging, we discover the depth of our own compassion. Compassion. 